Hello and welcome back to Crusader Kings 2 tutorial series. In this episode we're going to be talking about how to declare a war and then how to win a war. And we're going to be talking about two different ways of declaring war. Because in this game you need a reason to declare, you need a Cassus belly. It's basically, um, you say to someone, I'm declaring war on you for this reason. There are a ton of different ones in the game, ranging from just general conquest to uh, like uh, holy wars to crusades. Uh, per the name of the game, um, but we're going to be talking about two that apply to all religions. We're going to be talking about claims and we're going to be talking about de jure. Now, de jure is something you should remember from one of our previous episodes. De jure is basically the land that should be underneath a realm. So, for instance, we are currently the Holy Roman Emperor. If we have a look at the Holy Roman Empire, we can click this de jure thing and we can see what our border should be. Now, if there was any land outside our borders, like say this tiny bit of Zealand, which should by rights be part of our land, we could declare war on France because that is who the land is underneath. So if we were to click say on King Philippe here, we could declare war for our de jure claim on Zealand because we have a reason to declare. And um, we could also, actually I've clicked on our Duke's one. This is our de jure claim. We can also declare for our Duke, who is one of our vassals. This is also within his duchy. It, it, Hopefully that makes sense. So we could declare saying this land should be ours. Historically, this was always part of this title. Therefore, it should be ours. The other type of war that I was talking about is claim. So let's take a look at the claim that we have here. This is a strong claim on the county of Lubais. This means that whenever we want, we could declare on the county of Lubais for this claim. So if we go up to Lubais here and we were to declare, you'll see that we have claim Lubais as one of the reasons we could declare. Now, strong claim means that we can do this whenever we want. Um, there's no restrictions, um, except for being bankrupt or um, the other one is if we have troop, if we have uh, army levies raised. So, those are the two reasons you can't declare war in all circumstances. If you have no money, you can't pay your troops. And if you already have troops raised, it doesn't let you declare it. That's to stop you doing the uh, thing where you can get all your troops raised. So you can just kind of walk them on top of the province and say, we're declaring war and then instantly win because they can't raise their men up. Otherwise, they'll get killed by your troops. So basically, uh, those are the two reasons you can't declare war. Or two big reasons. There are other reasons why you might not be able to declare, but they're all kind of circumstantial and don't always turn up and play. Those are two ones that apply to all situations. So that's what a strong claim is. Now, ours can be inherited. So this means that um, our first child, our second child, and a third child, uh, so if we had three heirs, they could, they would all inherit this claim. And this is kind of showing like this is a proper claim, this is a title that we have proper rights to, um, our family has rights to it. It's kind of like, it's an ingrained kind of claim that we could press whenever we wanted to. And that's what it is, like this is what a strong claim with that can be inherited is. Now, if we were to say use our council here and we were to use the fabricate claim decision to have got this claim we would still get a strong claim it would be a claim that we could press whenever we wanted however this claim would actually be slightly different this would be a strong claim that cannot be inherited and this would mean that um basically we would have to declare a war and then it would get converted into a strong claim that can be inherited basically it's saying that we've got a claim that's strong but maybe under scrutiny wouldn't really pass like people maybe would look at it a little bit weirdly and it wouldn't really pass on to the next generation but if we were to declare a war over it even if we lost the war that shows like there was some weight behind the claim it was strong enough that we were willing to press it it's kind of like we're showing to the world yeah this claim's big enough we can do it now the next type of claim is a weak claim now if we have a look here i believe the holy, holy roman empire has some weak claimants there we go which should give us a good idea. So a weak claim is uh, shown by, it's still in the claim section, but it doesn't have the little border. So if we go back to us here, you'll see that our border is green, but if we go back to her, her border is not green. This means she has a weak claim. Now, a weak claim is similar to a strong claim in a lot of ways, but is obviously slightly weaker. So a weak claim can only be pressed under certain circumstances. If there is a female ruler, if the claimant is male, if there is a regency, if titles are already being contested in a claim or succession war, or if the person who has the weak claim is third or second in line to inherit. So basically this is saying that a weak claim cannot be pressed like just whenever you want, but if the title is under some turmoil, like if there's some somebody else who says it should be theirs, there's a little bit of confusion you could declare, 
if their person who's in charge is not very strong. So if they're a female ruler, if they're um, a child, or if they're incapable. Uh, this is not this is not my opinion of a female ruler. This is just uh, the way it was in the Middle Ages. I think that's the right uh, terminology. And uh, titles, the claimant is second or third in line to inherit. So this is basically saying, if you're closer to the title, like, you can say, well, my weak claim's worth a little bit more because I am actually in line to inherit this naturally. So that's what a weak claim is. So this can also be inheritable or uninheritable, and it's kind of the same as a strong claim. If you press it, then it would become an inheritable claim. And that's basically what claims are. So this should give you a brief understanding of how to declare a de jure war and how to declare a, um, a claim war. So what we're going to show you now is how you would actually go about waging the war. So we're going to do one, a situation that's a little bit easy. We're going to do one where there's no chance of us losing the war, just as an example of how you might do it. So we'll click on Lubais here. We'll click on the count. We would right click on him. We'd go to declare war. Then we go to claim Lubais. And then we would send our claim. Right. We have now declared the war. Now what we can do is we can raise up all of our troops. So what we will do is we would raise up all of our troops here. And we'd raise up all of our vassal troops. Raising up our own troops um, is just kind of saying these are the ones that we directly own. Vassal troops, ones that the vassals are going to give you through their levies, through uh, different laws. And that will affect. And we'll look into that later in a different episode. Now... Uh, if you raise up vassal troops, quite a lot of the time, vassals will be unhappy that you've raised their troops, but that's depending on culture and religion. Now, what you want to do to merge up all your troops and get into one army is you want to click down here, and you want to make a bounding box. So you click, drag, and you can make a box over all of them, and that'll select all of your troops. And what you do is you'll send them all to one province. So let's send them all to our capital here. And now we're going to wait for them to go. And we're going to do something we haven't done yet. We're going to unpause the game. Now we're going to play it on a pretty fast speed just so that everything works. And we're going to ignore any events that are not directly related to the war. Just so that we can get through this a little bit quicker. There's a whole bunch of events here we could look at. But we don't really need to bother with that for our war. Yes. So all of our troops are merging together. You'll see that we have a little skull here. This means that we have too many troops for our province. We'll talk about that kind of thing uh, in a little bit when we go into more advanced combat. But basically, what we'll do is we'll merge together all of our troops. I should have shown you how to do that. We'll split the army in half so I can show you how to do that properly. I was using the keyboard command G will do it. But what you can do is you can select all the troops in a province and you can just click this merge the selected units button. And that'll merge them all together. Now, each uh, unit you have can have commanders. Now, each commander, generally you just want to pick whoever has the highest marshal. That's a good way of just working out commanders if you don't want to get too far into it. So we'll select this one, this one, and this one. It sorts by Marshall for you. So that should give you a reasonable set of commanders. They're not always the best, but they're reasonable. And then what you want to do is you want to select the army. You want to right click on the province you want to go to. So we want to go to Lubais, and we'll just let the army go on its way. Right. Now, we have caught the other army. We have actually caught their army. And we're in a battle. Now, a battle is three flanks versus three flanks. And basically, if a flank loses, then it's two flanks versus one flank. And basically, you don't need to worry about that. There's a whole bunch of advanced combat that we will go into in a later episode. But basically, large number beats small number. So we have 15,000 troops versus 700 troops. So our larger number will beat their smaller number. Fairly simple. And that's all their troops have died. This is basically what this screen shows you. It's just casualties. And now we are on the Siege screen, which is actually cool because I haven't seen this part of Reaper's Jew where it puts up this little army. Well, we're going to close. Oh, oh, you can't close that independently. Interesting. So now we're going to look at the Siege screen. So when we're sitting on a province we want to capture, we just don't move the army and it'll automatically start sieging. And now it shows you us as the attackers. We have 15,000 troops versus them as the defenders who have 500 troops. Then if we hover over the defenders, it'll show you how much morale they will use, they will lose per day. And this basically shows you how long it will take for it to siege. So we've got 14.5%, so like 9 or 10 different uh, sets of 12 days. So if they lose 14.5% every 12 days, yeah. So it'll take like 120 days, 108 days, something like that. And then we will finish the siege. So we'll let it go through those days. You'll see it ticking down. And once it gets all the way to the bottom, 
you will see that we have won the siege. And down here, you'll see that we've got our little summary of our war. It says we have 100% war score. This basically means that we have achieved everything we need to in the war. They are ready to surrender. And we have we basically got everything we could get. Now, we're not going to finish the war just now. Because I want to show you something else here. If we continue to siege. And we got some of the lower pr uh, provinces here. Uh, we're going to ignore his peace, peace deal as well. We'll get the lower provinces. You'll see that if we click on here. We now have a ticking war score at the bottom. It says... Kaiser Henrik IV of the Holy Roman Empire controls Lubais. This basically means like, um, say we were attacking uh, Denmark here, and we'd only declared for Holstein. Well, what we would do is we would siege down Holstein, and then at that point, we would start getting this ticking war score. But, because Denmark has a lot of other provinces, they wouldn't necessarily want to surrender straight away. So if we got into a little bit of a stalemate where we were able to hold on to Holstein and Denmark wasn't able to push us off, but we, neither of us were able to get any more land, what would happen is our war score over time would slowly go up, and then we would be able to uh, enforce our demands at that point when we got to 100%. Anyway, just a small aside. So, what we want to do here is we want to click on his face. This will then open up this kind of general overview of the war screen. You click Offer Peace. And this allows you to then enforce demands, offer white peace, or surrender. Surrendering means you will lose the war and you will have to pay whatever penalties that uh, entails. White peace means that you uh, kind of say, neither of us get anything out of this war. But generally, you'll lose a bit of prestige. Basically, it's like, I declared a war, which we weren't able to win. So it kind of looks bad for you and it looks good for them. And then enforce demands means that you get everything that you want. And uh, we're going to go for that. He will accept it. That's because he has lost the war. We'll click yes. And that now means that we have taken his province up here. And that's how you declare a war in Crusader Kings 2. Next time we're going to go into a lot of the stuff that we haven't looked at yet. We're going to look at the laws screen, technology screen. Finish off a few of those so you have a basic understanding of everything the game was asking you to do. And then we'll go into some basic example scenarios. After that we'll probably go into some advanced concepts like uh, looking at... Um, wars in maybe a little bit more of a advanced way looking at how you might want to marry into people to get different claims look at different religions things like that anyway thank you for watching and if you have any questions on this episode please leave them in the comments below